Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Can everybody hear me and see the presentation okay? Yes. Great, thank you. Uh, good morning and welcome to today's student success workshop on active listening and note taking. The session will be recorded and posted on our website. Um, a little bit of introductions. My name is Allison Nick and I'm a PhD candidate in the English department at the University of Mississippi. My research focus is on transatlantic women's writing from mid 20th century and the Second World War. I often teach English literature surveys, so like 222 to 226 um, and writing 101 and 102. This semester I'm teaching a class on British World War II literature. And I serve as a graduate mentor for EDHE 101 and 303 classes and have previously worked at the UM Writing Center. This workshop today is put on by the Academic Success Program Department of the Center for Student Success and First Year Experience. We are located in Johnson Commons East. We also provide academic consultations, student success coaching, and a schedule of other great student success workshops like this one available throughout the semester. More information on these can be found at our website. Uh, for updates, follow us on social media. Sometimes note-taking note can seem tedious or unnecessary. Maybe it causes a lot of stress or anxiety, um, but note-taking can also be a really important part of learning, and hopefully this workshop will provide you with some useful skills to make note-taking easier. Uh, you may be tempted to not take notes because you'd rather focus on the lecture or you think you will remember what the professor is saying. Um, however, you will always remember less than you think you will. Even if the lecture is recorded, it can be a lot of work to rewatch lectures and that's valuable study time that can be saved by taking notes. The process of writing something down also helps you to learn the material better. It activates other modes of learning than just auditory, so you have different pathways in your brain that are trying to get at the same information. And finally, good note taking requires that you think about the material, draw conclusions, and reconceptualize the ideas, all of which are higher order processes that will help your memory and recall. So not only will you learn the material better, but you'll be able to remember it better. A large part of taking good notes is actually just listening well. Um, so we have this idea of active listening. Um, the best way I think to tell if you're a practice active, practicing active listening is to think of it like having a compassionate conversation with a friend. When you talk to a friend, you might nod your head or add interjections to let them know that you're listening. You would probably be maintaining eye contact and avoid looking at your phone or being distracted by the things around you. In class, you also want to be listening for main ideas in their organization. Don't just listen to what the professor is currently saying. Actively try to think about how that relates to what they've said previously. Finally, you should pay attention to what kind of content is being delivered and adjust your note-taking approach accordingly. So you might not take the same kind of notes in every class or every lecture. Before I start explaining exa examples of different note-taking practices and strategies, I want to pause and give y'all a chance to talk um, in case you want to share uh, what your experience has been with taking good notes, what you find challenging, um, and you know what things have worked well for you, whatever you'd like to share. Um, feel free to jump in or use the chat. Um, well, for me, whenever I take notes, I like to write out questions and then write out answers, kind of like practicing like I'd be taking a test because I feel like it just prepares me um, like to learn the information better, um, practicing as if I would be taking an actual test. Okay, yeah, that's a really great strategy and one that I haven't actually heard a lot before. So that's a really great one to share. It kind of forces you to imagine what you think the professor would ask, which is sort of a way of learning the material from the opposite end. 
Any other um, thoughts about note taking to share? Okay, well, I have the chat box open. So if you think of any questions or ideas that you wanna add, please feel free to, to add them in. Um, I'll move on now to talking about um, a few facts just that I thought were, were nice to think about when you're approaching how to take good notes. Um, first, taking notes rewires your brain. Scientists have shown that writing ideas down and organizing them into notes actually forges new pathways in your brain to help you learn better. Second, the amount of notes actually relates to how much you learn. So the more notes you take, the more you will remember. Um, I think that seems pretty obvious, but sometimes it can seem like a chore to like write everything down, but the act of writing it down helps you learn it. Um, so the more that you do it, the more you will learn. Um, third, this one I really thought was helpful. Adding visuals to your notes makes them more effective. Um, so good news for doodlers out there. Drawing images, maps, charts, adding color, highlighting, all of these things help to assist with learning. Um, so if you find that you are, are more um, prone to visual learning or if you enjoy, if you find it easier to focus during class, if you're sort of actively doodling, then just make your doodles match the information and it'll actually help you learn better. Um, and finally, we tend to think of note taking as a solo activity, but collaboration can actually boost the benefits of taking notes. Exchanging notes with a friend can help you see what you might have missed. Um, making charts or maps as a group from your collective notes can help you better process the material. Um, so it doesn't have to just be you taking notes, you can think of ways to, to incorporate it as a group project or a, a project with a friend, um, and it will help give you more comprehensive notes. Okay, so our first note-taking method is the Cornell method. Um, this is sort of a standard method that you may have um, seen before. I'm gonna jump to the next slide because it has a nice diagram and then we'll come back to this one. Um, so the Cornell Notes has three main components. On the left-hand side of the page is this Q column. Um, then there's the note-taking area in the main part of the page, and then at the bottom, a summary section. And so basically, during class, you try your best to take notes in the note-taking area and write down as much of it as you can. And then as class goes or after class, you come back to the Q column and add major themes or ideas, dates, terms, whatever things are really important for you to remember. And then maybe at the end of lecture, even at the end of a week, you might go back and write summaries of each page of your notes so you have a sense of what is being said and maybe can draw some of those bigger conclusions about the material rather than just factual ones. And it's kind of a chance to help you sort of synthesize ideas um, and, you know, summary is sort of part of the writing process, so it, it can be a helpful thing to practice that regularly. To go back to um, when I find them most useful, for Cornell Notes, um, I think it works well with sort of synchronous or asynchronous lectures, so whether you're, you're watching something pre-recorded or if it's a live class. Um, for the pre-recorded ones, what might be really useful is to pause and add those cues and summaries as you go because you have the power to pause. Um, so that's something to think about. You know, you can take notes while you're listening, but then you can pause and sort of pull out the important things as you go. Um, I think it also works well handwritten or typed as long as you set up your page with all those sections beforehand. Um, and at the end, I have a, a template that I will put in the chat, which can be really useful if you like to type up your notes. The next method um, that I want to share with you all is outlining. Um, right, so you use bullets or numbering and indentation to organize thoughts by how they relate to one another. So I have, again, another slide that shows sort of what that looks like, right? This is a very classic outline setup with Roman numerals, letters, and then numbers. So um, it helps you kind of think about how things relate to each other and try to uh, uh, 
combine them into categories or organize them into categories. Um, I think this works best typed because word processing programs will do the outlining and the numbering for you and it's pretty automatic and you can easily change where something goes if you decide it needs to go into a different category. Um, just be careful in class that you don't get sort of overwhelmed by making the outline of your notes perfect. Um, you can always go back and change that later. Um, so the 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 focus should still be on getting as much information on the page as you can, but this can help you sort of at least start thinking about how the ideas connect and then you can go back later and really make them organized. Um, I especially like using this method for taking notes on textbook readings because textbooks are often already organized and divided into sections. So the the organizing format is there for you and then you can take notes underneath for each section and also then you will know exactly what part of the textbook you got those notes from if you need to go back and look at it. Um, so I highly recommend that. And then also don't forget about reverse outlining as a technique. Um, I do this a lot when writing papers. You like write a draft and then reverse outline your own paper to see exactly what you did say and what you're missing and where there might be gaps in your argument. Um, but I think a good study technique can also be to reverse outline your own notes because um, it'll sort of help you maybe think about how they are organized or draw connections to things, or if you, you have gaps, then you know what to go and ask your professor in office hours or your TA, or you can ask a friend, well, you know, I missed this part now that I'm looking back through my notes, there's something missing here. Um, how do these things connect? Um, so that's sort of like a meta technique to kind of outline your own notes. And finally, the last, um, Note-taking method is visual mapping, and I think um, this one is maybe the least um, obvious or conventional. This involves creating a graphic representation of the lecture information, so you have to have active participation and processing of ideas as you're listening. Um, it can look like a traditional web map, so here's one example with the main thing in the middle and then all the things coming off of it. Um, but you could also do a chart or another kind of visual representation. And I think the key is that whatever visual thing you choose, it should match the material. So that's the processing part of it. You have to sort of conceptualize all the ideas as a whole in order to decide how best to represent it um, visually. Um, I also recommend using numbers and color coding, but probably do that kind of stuff after class so it's not distracting during the lecture. Um, so try to, you know, focus on getting the ideas down and how to organize them during class and then you could go back and sort of add those details that make it even more um, useful. Um, if you imagine to a biology textbook, they often portray complex biological pathways by mapping them out because it's much easier to learn information that way. So I think this is best for those sort of memorization heavy classes or ones with lots of, you know, um, details and ideas that you have to like memorize in relation to each other. Cause then visual, like seeing it visually will be another way that you can remember it. Okay, and so during a previous version of this workshop, someone asked a really great question about how best to take notes um, from a PowerPoint, which I think is, you know, increasingly important as I am also using a PowerPoint for this talk. Um, I think most people do these days. Um, so I wanted to address that because I thought it was a really great question. And so what I've done is sort of broken it up into three questions to sort of ask what, uh, of your lecture. You know, like once you go to the first class and you see how they're handling lecture, these are the questions to ask about how to adapt to a PowerPoint. Um, so first, does the professor provide you with the PowerPoint? So if you, um, you might need to check Blackboard regularly or see if they get uploaded at class, after class. So like, maybe not all professors advertise that they've made them available, but they might actually be on Blackboard. Um, so if you actually get the file before class, which may be kind of rare, but maybe some professors do it, I would recommend taking notes on the PowerPoint itself. 
um, by using the comment feature or by adding it into the speaker notes section because then all of your, in your information, your notes, and the PowerPoint will be in one place, which will make it a lot easier to study. Um, since I think very few professors give it out beforehand, um, that might not be as important as those that give it out after class. Um, so if you get the PowerPoint uploaded after class, then don't stress as much during class about writing down what's on the slide. Sort of pause and remember that you, you will have that information later and what's important now is to, to pay attention to what the professor is saying and write down how they're connecting the information, how they're processing or analyzing the information that's on the slide. Um, then you can go back and integrate those sort of higher level notes with the specific facts that are on the PowerPoint. Um, those might be good classes for trying out visual mapping because you don't have to worry so much about, you know, noting every fact that's on the slide, but you can start thinking about how they connect or how you would better understand them visually. Um, of course, if the professor doesn't provide the PowerPoint file, then you have to think about how much information that the professor is including and sort of how they're using that information. Um, good presentation skills usually dictate that less is more, but not all subjects and not all teaching styles follow that rule. Um, if, the si if the slides tend to be chock full of information, then that's going to pretty much be the, the most difficult kind of lecture to take notes on. So being aware of that challenge is, is sort of helpful for adapting. And I think something like the Cornell methods would be the most beneficial for just a really like information heavy PowerPoint. Um, because that just forces you to write down as much of it as you can and then go back later and add those cue terms and add those summaries that maybe you remember right after class but aren't going to remember forever. So taking that time right after class to sort of process all the information you wrote down and pull out the most important um, dates and terms and then summarize it, that will help you when you're just like furiously trying to take notes during class. Um, and If the professor includes a lot less information, um, then that kind of gives you an opposite problem. It can be really, you know, tempting to write down only what's on the PowerPoint. Um, but if you do just that, you're going to miss a lot of important information because most likely they just put the most key terms up there, but they don't have the definition. So if you don't write the definition, if you don't write what they're saying about those bullet points, then you're missing a lot of information. For example, on this slide that I'm talking about right now, I only included the three questions that I thought were useful, but if you only wrote those questions down, you might miss why they're important or how to use them to adapt your note taking or what's, what sort of tricks or skills I'm offering through those questions. So you want to try to make sure even if it's a really sparse PowerPoint that you're, you're writing down, all the bigger ideas that the professor is saying um, about those like those terms or questions or whatever is on the slide. Um, and then finally, it's important to kind of consider how the professor uses the information. Um, not all presentations connect directly to the lecture. There might be images that illustrate an idea, but you know, the image itself isn't what's important. It's the concept. Um, so it's important to sort of really take note of what is important between what's on the slides and what the professor is saying. And it's kind of a back and forth to decide, you know, how to take notes on that and what's useful. Unfortunately, sometimes that can take a while in the semester to become obvious. Um, so I really suggest talking to your professor or your TA during the first week of classes if you feel like you never know what to write down. They can help you um, sort of see what will be important for tests or papers or what is the key information. Um, but really the, the most important part is to pay attention to the to what the professor is saying and what they're and especially when they get into ideas that are more analysis based or you know combining of ideas or um, things like that. For example, you know they might put one scholar's opinion up on the slide but then verbally say what they think about that opinion and what they might agree or disagree with it. And so that's the valuable part, being able to analyze or respond to another scholar's work. So if you only write down what the other scholar said, you're kind of missing how the professor sort of modeled the analysis for you. So things like that will help you sort of combine PowerPoints and lectures. 
And it's definitely not easy. So that's why a lot of times talking to the professor or the TA can really help you get better at that over the semester. Um, so my kind of big takeaway reminder is that there's no right way to take notes. And in fact, note taking methods work best if you adapt them to each specific class. Um, so I recommend that you take the time to list out all of your classes and sort of reflect on what kind of content it is, what's the lecture format, what is the instructor's style, how do they make use of PowerPoints, and then see what, what note taking method you think will be best for that class. Um, if you're less organized than that, you might just try out different methods over the course of a week and see which ones work best. Um, the trial and error method is always good. And then finally, since I'm a book nerd and an English major, I just wanted to share that um, this idea of marginalia, these are the marks that you make in the margins of a book. And it's actually a whole subfield of medieval studies to look at the, the drawings and doodles that monks made in manuscripts. Um, and so for example, this angry fighting snail in this slide is a very common doodle found in a lot of margins. Something about fighting snails was very exciting to medieval monks. Um, so my, my advice from this is to always read with a pencil in hand and write down your thoughts and ideas. Um, when I read a novel, I try to collect main themes. So as I'm reading, I'll underline ideas that interest me and write next to it what theme it's part of. So maybe gender, or if it's a repeated word or imagery, like flower imagery. And then as I keep reading, I keep tagging all the quotes related to those themes. So it's easier to connect them. Um, there's this one author named Henry Green who has a lot of random birds in his books. And so if you were to open one of his off my shelf, you would probably see the word bird written <laughs> in the margins, like throughout the whole novel. Um, and if you really want to be meta, you might even try writing marginalia on your own notes. So this is sort of what the Cornell method asks you to do is go back and sort of add the key terms. Um, but you could do it to another extent. You could really like leave notes to yourself or, um, you know, tag ideas throughout all of your notes. And it could be a way of actively rereading your notes that helps you process them more. Okay, so, um, Next, I thought we would sort of do some active learning and try a note-taking method. Um, I have this short video that is, I think, a useful one for practicing. So if you wanna um, grab a piece of paper and a pencil, I'm also going to um, add the template for the Cornell notes into the chat if you would like to use that. Because um, I think it's, it's nice to just have that set up in a Word document already. Um, And if I can get back to my video, I'm gonna go ahead and play it and just, you know, try out a method and see how it works. And then we can, we can talk about sort of questions and how it went after the video. In this case. In a time-lapse video, it looks like a monster coming alive. For a moment, it sits there innocuously. Then, ripples move across its surface. It bulges outwards, bursting with weird boils. It triples in volume. Its color darkens ominously. And its surface hardens into an alien topography of peaks and craters. Then the kitchen timer dings. Your cookie is ready. What happened inside that oven? Don't let the apron deceive you. Bakers are mad scientists. When you slide the pan into the oven, you're setting off a series of chemical reactions that transform one substance, dough, into another, cookies. When the dough reaches 92 degrees Fahrenheit, the butter inside melts, causing the dough to start spreading out. Butter is an emulsion, or mixture of two substances that don't want to stay together, in this case, water and fat, along with some dairy solids that help hold them together. As the butter melts, its trapped water is released. And as the cookie gets hotter, the water expands into steam. It pushes against the dough from the inside, trying to escape through the cookie walls, like Ridley Scott's chest-bursting alien. Your eggs may have been home to squirming salmonella bacteria. An estimated 142,000 Americans are infected this way each year. Though salmonella can live for weeks outside a living body and even survive freezing, 136 degrees is too hot for them. 
When your dough reaches that temperature, they die off. You'll live to test your fate with the bite of raw dough you sneak from your next batch. At 144 degrees, changes begin in the proteins, which come mostly from the eggs in your dough. Eggs are composed of dozens of different kinds of proteins, each sensitive to a different temperature. In an egg fresh from the hen, these proteins look like coiled up balls of string. When they're exposed to heat energy, the protein strings unfold and get tangled up with their neighbors. This linked structure makes the runny egg nearly solid, giving substance to squishy dough. Water boils away at 212 degrees, so like mud baking in the sun, your cookie gets dried out and it stiffens. Cracks spread across its surface. The steam that was bubbling inside evaporates, leaving behind airy pockets that make the cookie light and flaky. Helping this along is your leavening agent, sodium bicarbonate, or baking soda. The sodium bicarbonate reacts with acids in the dough to create carbon dioxide gas, which makes airy pockets in your cookie. Now it's nearly ready for a refreshing dunk in a cool glass of milk. One of science's tastiest reactions occurs at 310 degrees. This is the temperature for Maillard reactions. Maillard reactions result when proteins and sugars break down and rearrange themselves, forming ring-like structures, which reflect light in a way that gives foods like Thanksgiving turkey and hamburgers their distinctive rich brown color. As this reaction occurs, it produces a range of flavor and aroma compounds, which also react with each other, forming even more complex tastes and smells. Caramelization is the last reaction to take place inside your cookie. Caramelization is what happens when sugar molecules break down under high heat, forming the sweet, nutty, and slightly bitter flavor compounds that define, well, caramel. And in fact, if your recipe calls for a 350 degree oven, it'll never happen since caramelization starts at 356 degrees. If your ideal cookie is barely browned, like a Northeasterner on a beach vacation, you could have set your oven to 310 degrees. If you like your cookies to have a nice tan, crank up the heat. Caramelization continues up to 390 degrees. And here's another trick. You don't need that kitchen timer. Your nose is a sensitive scientific instrument when you smell the nutty, toasty aromas of the Maillard reaction and caramelization, your cookies are ready. Grab your glass of milk, put your feet up, and reflect that science can be pretty sweet. Okay, does anyone wanna share how that went or thoughts on trying out some of these note-taking methods? Also, if anyone has any questions or um, comments for the, for the whole presentation. All right, well, thank you all for coming. I'm gonna go ahead and um, stop recording and then I'll stick around for a few minutes if anyone wants to talk more about note-taking, um, but I hope you all have a great rest of your week. Thank you.